Okay, so this video is going to be about the current funding situation in the United Kingdom. I've got to put across right at the start that the views I'm about to espouse are mine, mine alone, and do not represent the University of Nottingham, 60 Symbols, Brady Harren, or anybody connected with 60 Symbols. So science is funded via the government, um, and the government provides money to something, well, to two, to two major institutions, or two major bodies. One of which is the research councils, who fund the bulk of scientific research in the country. There are other private sources, there are other charitable sources, like the Wellcome Trust, for example, Leverhulme Trust, various other sources, but the bulk, at least of physics research, is funded through two main councils the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council and the Science and Technologies Facilities Council. On the other hand, we've got something called the Higher Education Funding Council for England, which supplies a block grant, a large amount of, of, of money to, to, in, to different universities on the basis of something called the Research Excellence Framework. The furore at the moment is really focused and has been for a number of months now, has been focused on changes that the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council is making. You know, any scientist is always going to say, please, please, I need more funding, I need more funding because what I do is desperately important for the future of the world and we're all doomed without it. Of course, that's the case if I overstate it a little. But the, this is a real sea change. What's happening now with one of our research councils, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, is a real sea change, a real dramatic change in how um, uh, research money, how research is funded in the, in the United Kingdom. What happened before was that the, the entire system was largely based around something called responsive mode funding. Now that's a technical term, but it's very, very simple to understand. An a, a, an academic would have an idea. He might talk to his um, talk to somebody down the corridor. He might talk to somebody in a different university. He might talk to somebody in a completely different country, and they'll develop that idea and they write it up as an application. You'll submit it. Then that grant goes to a number of different referees anonymously. It could be three. It could be. I think the most I ever had was six, and um, those referees will come back with comments and. You know, they might say this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, though there's always one referee, always one. You can have five glowing sets of comments and there'll always be one blasted referee that damns it with faint praise or damns it with worse than faint praise. But the key thing is there, you get the referee's comments in and you as an academic have the opportunity to respond to those. That's the first stage. The second stage is it then goes to a panel, again of your peers, and they, they might have 50 or 60 grants to look at. And they, those grants were looked at on the basis of scientific quality. And, you know, if you came out the top, great. Um, you, you were likely to get funded, but only if you were in the, say, top 20%. That's what success rates are, are off the order of 20%. They've gone up a little bit, but off that order. And, um, but so throughout that process, it was the scientific community that was defining where, basically where the funding went. And because the scientific community are on top of, of you know, what are the, the, the new areas of science, what are the exciting areas of science, does this have a particular um, uh, important application that might stem from it, does this um, really change our understanding fundamentally about a particular area. So what's changed is that the research council, many of whom are not active scientists, I'll change that, the majority of whom are not active scientists, are making the decisions on the basis of their attempts to predict what's going to be important. And we know, we look back through history time and time and time again, where the really groundbreaking stuff has, has really come out of left field. The laser being a key example. You know, Guy Towns that developed the laser was told by his head of department, stop mucking around with that and go and do something more useful instead. And he, luckily enough, had the stubbornness and the ability to just continue on with this work. And you know, look what happened to the laser. And time and time again, we can see that 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 that, that cropping up. The the key question, I guess, we've got to ask is, what are universities for? What are, what is university research for? And the 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 key aspect of this is that you're doing work that is not necessarily near market, that is not necessarily near term, that is not going to give you an application in five years. I would argue that a key characteristic of um, academic research is it's exploratory, it's curiosity driven, is that you're trying to push back the boundaries of knowledge. There's a wonderful, wonderful quote from, I love this quote, I find this really, really inspirational, from Drew Faust, who's the president of Harvard, 
This is from her inaugural address a few years ago. A university is not about results in the next quarter. It is not even about who a student has become by graduation. It is about learning that moulds a lifetime, learning that transmits the heritage of millennia, learning that shapes the future. And that's why this raft of changes that the various, it's not just EPSOC, it's not just the Physics Council, it's right across the board. They are introducing a whole range of different changes which push us towards Tell me what the, you know, five years time, what the impact, what the economic impact of your work is going to be. But surely in times of austerity, the first thing you start to cut is non-crucial things. You know, if I was, when, if I had a big pay cut, I start eating out less, I start going to the movies less, I start yep. cutting my non-essentials. Okay. Why shouldn't science be cutting its non-essentials? Excellent question, Brady. All right, deep breath. So, key thing is, we can pr approach this from a very ideological, pure scientific perspective, as I've discussed. Let's think about the economics. What is the fundamental economic rationale for the government to support science? The fundamental economic rationale is that it's far from market. Because if it's near market, the market should be supporting it. Industry should be pumping that money in to do the R&D. Otherwise, what we're doing is we're simply subsidising industry. And what's very remarkable is we're continually told about the importance of markets and the free market is so important and let the market do what it says. And yet, when it comes to um, so many multinational industries, they are subsidised to the hilt. Right? And the question is, is it actually economically better to cut this funding? And it turns out that there's, if I can pull out this particularly important paper. Here's a paper commissioned by the Treasury. I have a whole stack of these up there. The, um, commissioned by the Treasury, uh, as you can see, a decade ago. The economic benefits of publicly funded basic research or critical review. This was commissioned by the Treasury. Basically, the key benefits, the economic benefits of academic science are not the intellectual property we generate, are not the spin-offs we generate. They're the people we train, they're the developments in knowledge, and if we put those out in the public domain, if we publish those, make it widely available, that's where the real benefits of academic science come. The government is elected by the people. You're spending public money. Why shouldn't the government, as my representative, decide how you spend my money? Extremely good question. The, the key thing is, is the government best placed to decide where are the key advances in science? Uh, or where they're going to stem from. Is the government best placed to say, right, we're going to fund this area, this area, this area, this area. Is that necessarily going to lead to the best science? Or do you want people who are actually informed, the scientific community, about where science is to decide where that money goes? But scientists have a massive conflict of interest here. Surely there needs to be an independent, non-scientist, non, not part of the institution, making these decisions. Right, so let's say I get a grant to fund um, a, a grant in biotechnology or a grant in pure medical science or a grant in um, geology. Am I qualified to say that this is a good or a bad grant? No, I'm not. And I'm a scientist. I'm absolutely not. I place my trust in those people who are qualified in that area. Of course, peer, peer review has flaws. Like democracy, it has its flaws. But it's the very best system we've got. And um, the key thing is that if you just let the government decide what happens, particularly with this government, is that it's not the government decides. It's industry and corporations that decide where we go. And that's exactly what's happening here. That's exactly where, what's happening. But if we let scientists decide how to spend research money, isn't there a danger... As we've done in the past. Yes. For isn't very many decades. Yes. Isn't there a danger they'll just keep going down the same alleys and same paths no. because they want to keep their own will no, going? No, no, absolutely not. Because if you get a grant that's 20-year-old um, science, uh, then, you, you know, you're bored by that. You say, well, you know... This, this is really not very interesting science. Let's move on and do something else. Yes, I'm not, of course, we're human. There's a, a, a physicist turned sociologist, a guy called John Zyman, who I have a huge amount of time for, largely because he came from a condensed matter physics background, like myself, moved into sociology. But because he's a physicist, he writes sociology so I can read it. Most sociology texts I pick up, and after the first couple of paragraphs of normative consequences, I have to put it down again. Zyman's different. And he talks about the legend with a capital L, this idea that we're all completely disinterested, objective searches for the truth. We're not. Of course we have vested interests. Of course we have... Um, uh, you know, we, we like to see funding come to our own area, or particularly to ourselves. But the, the, it's, you're always in competition 
um, in in terms of, of, of reviewers. You know, it's I have never ever received um, a set of comments on a grant um, from my peers grant application which are yeah absolutely funded. There were always you know one or two which will will say well maybe he should be doing something different. Maybe have we not done this before, etc. So. It's self-correct. I fundamentally believe it's self-correct. And yes, there are problems, but I think there would be much greater problems if we let government, i.e. industry and corporations, decide where we inject the funding. But the Research Council isn't telling you exactly what to point your microscope at and exactly what to do, are they? Aren't they, aren't they just giving you broad areas of research and isn't that quite a healthy thing? They are indeed, except it's not as broad as it could be. Before we had the vast majority of research was, folk, was funded via this responsive mode process. EPSRC even referred to this as their essential platform only a few years ago. Now the balance has been completely shifted to areas that EPSRC sees as being of strategic national interest. They are predicting it though. How do they know? Graphene's wonderful. How okay. do you know? I know, but, but is it not much better to rely on the scientific community who are on top of advances than to rely on some quango, to rely on some government body to dictate where these advances happen or tr try to predict where these advances happen? They've been wrong time and time again. You said one of the great things about science is serendipity. Surely it would be naive and foolish to make funding decisions based on luck. But surely you have to at least try and Absolutely, get. yeah, but you can put out a grant. The way it works and the way the system has worked is that you put a grant in a general, uh, you put in a grant application based on a particular premise and you send that to your peers. Is this entirely flawed? It, you know, has it got a, a, a possibility of working? But then you had the flexibility. Okay, you set out your grant application, you get the money. Then you had the flexibility, of you working along this pathway and suddenly you get this result, which is completely left of centre, you didn't expect. Then you had the flexibility to move in that direction. That flexibility is getting eaten away, eaten away. Are you funded by research councils? <laughs> yeah, no, there's, a, there's an interesting. At the moment, I'm an EPSRC fellow. So I have got quite a large grant at the moment, which I'm very grateful to my peers um, for awarding me that grant. I no longer submit EPSRC grants I know, because I no longer review them. And the reason I no long, longer review them is that since 2009, there's been the requirement to uh, submit a pathways to impact statement, which lays out the economic and socio-economic impact of your research. That's not why I do science. It's, it's, it's a nonsense. You know, if, again, if we go to the, the, the Research Council's website, if I can... If you, let me just go through all this. I've given this particular talk many times before. So what we've got in terms of this impact statement, draft the impact summary very early on in your preparation so that it informs the design of your research. That is not science. What, it, what that is is R&D. It's the D part of R&D. Define your users, define your beneficiaries, define your, your product and work towards that goal. That's not what science is about. So I cannot in all conscience submit grants where I'm expected to basically lie about my science. But you are being funded by them now? I am being funded by them now, yes. Is it a, that bit, was a, is it a bit naughty of you to be having a go at your... Are you biting the hand that feeds you? Um, we should bite the hand that feeds us. That's it's interesting that you bring that comment up, Brady, whether we want this in. I had exactly the, co the same comment across the table at a recent Institute of Physics meeting, um, a board meeting that I attended. That's university's job in society, to bite the hand that feeds, to talk truth to power, to, to question things. That's exactly your job. Rather than, OK, I'll keep my mouth shut because you've given me the money. If you do that, then you really are uh, in a bad state. It's not really going to be possible for me to interview the head of the EPSRC or the Prime Minister. Yeah. And you're getting a, you're getting a fair say here. You've been speaking True. for 25 minutes now. Yeah. As an intellectual exercise, for the next two or three minutes, will you pretend to be the head of the EPSRC yeah. and justify their position? Thank you. Yes. So the current head of the EPSRC is somebody called David Delpy, who I've um, communicated with on a number of cases and debated with. EPSRC response uh, to criticisms that I make, and it's not just me, there are very, very many academics across the country who feel like this, is that the, we're in a financial crisis. Um, it's very, very important that, uh, let me step back, we're in a financial crisis. The reason, the key, one of the key reasons that the science funding in the UK did so well, that wasn't cut in the last comprehensive spending review in the last budget, 
was because the research councils made the impact case to government, made the economic impact case to government. And therefore, we have to adopt a strategic role in these times of austerity. We have to um, make sure that we are using our money wisely. When you give money to your, your wonderful little children, though, they'd go straight out and spend it all on sweets and lollies. Sometimes you have to spend the money on your children's behalf because, really, they'll just spend it on what they want and not what they should be spending it on. I mean, if I gave you a billion pounds, I know exactly what you'd do. You'd spend all billion of it on your wonderful little experiments downstairs that you love so much, when really you should probably be putting some of it into the QMC hospital to help... I probably would, her. Brady. I probably would. If there was one billion, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain I wouldn't put it. I'd be really, really disgusted with myself if I put it all into the lab downstairs. I'm pretty certain I'd divide it up. I'd set up the, 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 the Haran Trust for, um, <laughs> for research and then fund, and then we wouldn't need the research councils. Woohoo! <laughs> You're quite well known within the university and almost in, in your sort of field for being really passionate about this yeah. and always being willing to speak up about it. Yeah. Why do that? Why make yourself such a target? Surely it's a bad thing for you, isn't it? It is a bad thing, yes, absolutely. Um, but it's something, you know, it's, why do you speak out about anything? It's, 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 it's wrong. It's fund I see it as fundamentally wrong. Um, there were flaws, and it's, it's not just a sort of, well, it is. A lot, I've got, let's be honest, a large amount of it is an ideology. I'm pretty, my politics are pretty left of centre, so there's obviously an ideology here. But there are important flaws, both in terms of how the scientific method and also in terms of, importantly, the economics of this, that the, the, the research councils just ignore. And I suspect that I'd like to think that they've actually read the literature and they've you know, really thought about this in depth. My suspicion is that they haven't. My suspicion is they do what the Treasury tells them to do, which is to, to drive academics to interact more with, with the market. That's more than enough, isn't it?